on that, that one. Right? So, yeah. With so Mars. Our next speakers are from uh, representing JD Hunt, Alex Young, and Mark Cooper. Uh, we're here uh, to be talk about um, uh, geospatial issues that you're the logistics and logistics at uh, JD Hunt. So yeah, definitely. So uh, I want to apologize for Doug not being here. Uh, our VP, he uh, uh, battled the uh, tornadoes that came through here recently, and so that's kind of what he's dealing with right now. So you've got uh, myself, uh, again, I'm the manager of the uh, GIS team at uh, JB Hunt, and then uh, Mark Cooper um, is our uh, third-party liaison that kind of hangs out with us and uh, helps us out with a bunch of different situations that we run into. So. Um, Oh, that one. So, uh, so uh, what what we are doing? So, what we're doing at JB Hunt is we are um, working with uh, near real time data processing on the fly analytics and spatial uh, big data. So, what that really means in a nutshell is asset tracking. Um, asset tracking on the in the sense of about ninety six thousand containers that are continuously moving back and forth across on the rail and then also 24,000 um, dry trailers, which are gonna be over the road, and then also the actual assets that carry those actual trucks, or those trailers, which is about 16,000, making about 140,000 total actual assets moving at any given point in time within the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Um, and this is actually not even including the 3PL, so if you wanna add that in, you add probably about another, probably 100,000 assets on top of that as well, so. Um, and uh, so uh, the um, biggest, the, the, one of the biggest things that we've got that we go on, that we're working with is the operational effect of collecting one minute pings versus 10 minute pings. And what we run into is basically the trade off to compute the resources versus of knowing where everything is at that given point in time versus a 10 minute interval where you're able to space them out. And so uh, it ends up being a lot of data that comes across and it has to go somewhere, so you're gonna end up paying for something. So, um, what um, the, other, uh, the other part that we've got is uh, the use of uh, convergent data to set, uh, to identify the map customer location. So, uh, basically kind of in a nutshell what you're looking, or these examples over here is kind of an example of this. So like on the top one that you're seeing, that is uh, a set of data points that we actually can map out uh, that's an actual rail yard. And so what we're able to do is to completely uh, isolate the rail yard and be able to do uh, geofencing and whatnot with those actual data sets. Um, and uh, unless it also allows us to do the uh, building footprints, various um, uh, using various image resources, uh, centerline data, zip codes, and other public uh, accessible data source, and which is the bottom uh, example and what you're seeing are um, uh, actually uh, buildings and yards that have actually been polygon that we use to track uh, locations of trailers and to also track uh, ETAs and a lot of other uh, 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 asset movement within that uh, given area. And uh, a lot of the other things that we work with is, is not only are we basic, we're actually considered an IT uh, part of the business, but we actually we go off into the other side and actually are in the business side and that's kind of where you're gonna end up getting a lot of your money from too is you gotta basically solve businesses problems. And so supporting individual businesses needs and requests. So basically going out to marketing, other parts of engineering and IT that are needing, that are needing these kinds of uh, telemetry uh, situations and uh, also parts of the business that will um, actually benefit from using this kind of research and this data information. Let me, let me, is this on? Let me augment uh, a little bit. Can you go back one slide? Sure. Um, on the, the use of a convergent data sets. Um, so in the top example where we're kind of building the, the geofence, the, the need for that level of automation is because there are, what, 300 to 400,000 accounts, uh, account locations essentially that would be very challenging. I mean, we, we've done some of it um, on a manual basis of, of drawing polygons by hand, but you know, we're trying to develop some kind of automated method for mapping out what can be something very simple. Of course, if you have a customer location that's in the middle of a forest, it'd be really easy to map a big concrete pad. 
Um, if it's in the middle of a city concrete jungle and it's an industrial complex where you have a bunch of different you know, um, trucking shipping yards next to each other, one blends into the other, it gets a lot more complex, which is why you can't just rely on you know, imagery or um, an address uh, to, to come up with, a, with a, a yard like this or a customer location like this. So the ability for us to draw something in an automated fashion is, is highly important. Uh, also, not only because of the sheer volume that exists, but the, the number of additions per day are you typically in two, the two hundreds. Two to three hundred. Yeah. yeah, so it's a constant um, task that's, uh, that's out there. Cool. So um, this is moving over into challenges. So uh, challenges in the sense of the logistics industry is actually kind of behind in uh, the times with technology. Uh, a lot of the companies that you run into actually run into the same problem of what we run into on kind of a daily basis and is it's the sheer volume of logistics and in the sense of you don't really think about it but the amount of freight that is moved across the United States in general is very scary to be honest with you and the, and so keeping track of that and being able to make sure that that gets from point A to point B and anything in between that happens you can react and make sure you make a good decision on what needs to happen um, so the other challenges is uh, is also uh, is is bringing um, the uh, the the other management and, and kind of that business that I was talking about over and kind of adopting this GIS technology. Uh, so basically, again, JB Hunt being around since 1961, they've been doing it for a while. And so when you introduce a new technology, it's got to come with a little bit of punch because it's they've been doing it for so long. It's they don't really, you, you've got to make sure that you can bring what they really want to be able to kind of move forward with the technology. Um, again, same concept as in the sense of introducing a to new technology, you know, asking the question of why are they paying one to two million dollars for software when they can actually just basically go out and replace the item that they lost. So basically using the technology to make sure that you can show them where the assets are to, to allow them to go get them or to go fetch them to make sure they're utilizing the assets to the full potential instead of it sitting in a yard lost for months on end. You're able to see it on a map and be able to point someone to that direction and go get it picked up to be able to move it because a sitting trailer is worthless unless you've got freight on it. So, um, and other challenges um, uh, or to correlate with comments today um, on kind of how to advertise GIS. And a lot of that, what we're doing as far as on our end, is doing a lot of uh, workshops with the business side and kind of getting them involved. We're also working on how to kind of put the GIS technology in, in their hands and being able to kind of show them how it works and to, just to basically kind of put them in a portal and let them run with it and kind of see what they do. Because I think, again, with being able to kind of share this out and then allow the company to kind of get a hold of it and then everybody else has their own idea of how to do things, and then they can share within that same company and share the ideas across. It continues to grow, and then that sharing momentum kind of grows into a lot of uh, new things that we can work with. So, um, the uh, and then adjusting to our working with and around direct uh, uh, directives from the management, um, and basically kind of adjusting to factors that we can't control. We have a lot of situations on the outside that we can't control so we basically have to battle certain situations to make sure that we can continue to move forward so and uh, the two uh, other examples over there are uh, bottom one is, is um, points of interest for like fuel stations throughout the United States and um, and then also the top one is uh, is, is actually combining uh, some weather and some uh, locations of certain points of interest that they're wanting to make sure so it's just basically anything that falls into like a hurricane or tornado anything that shows up that actually hits that point it'll alert somebody so that way they can make sure that everybody is is aware that something is possibly going to happen within that area Don't so drive the truck through a hurricane. right that yeah or a tornado those are bad too so yeah <laughs> so um and then, yep, I'll let you do the final um, I'll kind of finish up here for uh, some of the, the research challenges going forward. And these points are largely put together with regards to J.B. Hunt. Um, as a consultant, I work with many different industries, different sectors. So, you know, these kind of apply uh, across a lot of different areas that, that I end up working in with regards to 
data management and geospatial technology. Um, with, with JB Hunt, one of, one of the big points that, that uh, Doug wanted to make was when we are able to, to harness this big spatial data um, of all of our location pings and when we collect this for you know, months or years on end, how can we use that to look back, um, whether it's through a visualization or just hardcore you know, coding and data analysis, to um, make better decisions going forward? Can, are there little uh, bits that we can extract to optimize our routes? You know, FedEx was famous for eliminating left turns to the greatest extent possible to increase their profitability and, and um, reduce time on their, on their driving routes. Can we, you know, see some areas where we could make tweaks like that with, with the trucking routes? Um, <coughs> are there common areas where we can extract from the data? Uh, do drivers do certain things? Even though they have the software in their truck to tell them exactly what route to follow, they talk to each other and they know where problems area, problem areas are, bad pieces of road, uh, maybe some you know, items that could be wrong in, in terms of a, an overpass height, uh, maybe, you know, misattributed on, on our mapping system and some, or somewhere in the data and they know to drive around that. Can we extract that from some of these, uh, you know, location pings, whether it's a, you know, a one minute ping or a 10 minute ping, we can get that information. Um, <coughs> how do, it, it also kind of gets to the point of how do you get information from outside of your big data sets and, and that gets to the human aspect. So are there ways that we can incorporate into our in-cab systems um, better ways for the drivers to give automatic feedback so we're not having to rely on the big data analysis. We can get some almost you know, near real-time input at, from the human level. And then, <coughs> of course, th there's been a lot mentioned today about open source uh, versus commercial software. I think there's been a lot of reliance in private industry on commercial software, and it's probably heavier weighted in academia towards open source for a number of reasons, but there, there's, there are certain limitations to, uh, to certain software solutions, and sometimes you just have to bust out of the mold of relying on, on those commercial um, softwares. So I think that'll be a very important direction for J.B. Hunt to go. Um, strategic research partnerships, which I know J.B. Hunt has with the University of Arkansas and, and other research groups. And then strategic staffing, you know, are we hiring the correct people that are able to, you know, not just come in and, for lack of a better term, be an ISRI robot uh, for the company? Can, can, they, can they work outside the box and, and incorporate some of those open source technologies and, um, you know, have developers, which I know we have on our team, uh, developers that can step out of the development world and, and into the, the GI science world um, and, and get comfortable there uh, quickly. And then, uh, you know, there was, um, Devin brought up the, we, we got the, um, the benefit of going late in the day so we could put some extra points in here, but uh, Devin brought up the, the assumption of, you know, a geographic completeness um, uh, on the, on whether it's management or other end users, is, there's an assumption that we have all these maps, you know, Google can do it, so, you know, why, why can't we do it or why don't we have it? Um, and it's, it's, a, it's hard work to implement, you know, a newer technology, not not to us, but but a newer technology to a, to a mature business. Um, there's there's going to be a learning curve there. That's one of the things that I think you know we're working with and struggling with, and uh, and then that historical reliance on third party solutions. It's always if there's a problem, I can pick up the phone, call this software provider, and is their problem to fix? Well, now we have this in house. We have a team working on it, and there needs to you know be a cultural shift in understanding that it's going to take a while to you know, redevelop solutions and fix problems when they arise. And I think that's, that's what we've got. Thank you. Thank Any you. questions? Okay.